Yeah, so, uh, yeah, hey, uh, thanks for everybody here. Uh, I'm here with uh, Adam Sewell, uh, who is the PI of uh, one of NOAA's institutes that is uh, working on exploring uh, our oceans. And thanks to Adam and his team, uh, we got a ticket to to ride here in this expedition and, and testing the technology that, that we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, but before that, I'll, I'll give it to Adam here to introduce the program, uh, his institute and, and the work we're doing. And yeah. So mostly for you guys to learn about you know other opportunities to collaborate with uh, with uh, ocean partners. So yeah. Well, thanks, Thank Pablo. Yeah. So I'm Adam Sewell. I'm a professor at University of Rhode Island and the director of the NOAA Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. So NOAA has a number of cooperative institutes. This one's uh, directed to their priorities in ocean exploration, the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration, and our uh, objective, and when I say R, it's a consortium of uh, five institutions, including URI, Ocean Exploration Trust, the ship that we're on now, uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, University of New Hampshire, and University of Southern Mississippi. And together with all the expertise at those institutions, we go out and explore, like we're doing right now. We uh, develop and advance technologies that are going to help ocean exploration, which again, we're doing right now, and you're going to hear about and we work uh, to engage with the public and with students to train the next generation of, of ocean explorers. And right now we are on uh, the, the exploration vessel Nautilus. And I'm just gonna give you a quick look at, at that ship. Um, let's see, if I make it, that's the wrong button. Oh, yeah, right, that one. There we go. Right, so this is a, just a view of this uh, vessel. It, it holds about 50 people. About 30 of them are, are scientists. It, it routinely goes out and explores um, parts of the US EEZ. This is an organization, the Ocean Exploration Trust, that was founded by Bob Ballard and, and is one of the uh, key assets for the NOAA Ocean Exploration Program. And currently, we are about a thousand miles uh, south southwest of of uh, Hawaii, in a region uh, called the Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll. And this is a U.S. territory. You can see the lines on this map that define the U.S. EEZ, and a smaller box that defines the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. The area that we're in outside of the monument is, is currently proposed as a new marine, uh, national marine sanctuary. And so we're out here collecting information about the geology, the biology, the chemistry of this region in order to kind of help uh, inform the decision-making about this, this sanctuary process. And just to give you a, a sense of what we're seeing, we're seeing, uh, these amazing ecosystems on the seamounts of the Line Islands, this uh, ancient 80 million year old um, hotspot chain that uh, is composed of a lot of beautiful corals like this coral garden you see here and um, sponges like this uh, sponge you see here. And then of course, as a geologist, the beautiful rocks that uh, all these, these organisms attach to. And we're really excited um, as, a, as a group, uh, as a OECI, to be working with Impossible Sensing and Pablo on the technology that they've developed um, and, and moving us towards a future where we can collect even more information in situ on the ocean floor uh, to, to help with ocean exploration. But I think this technology has a, has a huge range of applications, of course, started um, in in an effort to explore ocean worlds, um, so you know one of the lessons from from this one we're we're being very um, successful in in adapting this technology to to our application, um, but also that there are tremendous opportunities for uh, the uh, space exploration community and the ocean exploration community to work together. So I would just encourage you. Um, as you as you see what Pablo has been able to accomplish out here, to think about other opportunities that you might have for for working in the oceans. We're really keen for for new partners, and uh, we have, you know, we love when when we bring the expertise of of groups 
in different domains and put them together with our expertise in ocean work and and see what we can we can do. Uh, so feel free to check out our website at www.oeci.org. And also, you know, as Pablo mentioned, if you look behind us, you're seeing our, our control van for the remotely operated vehicle Hercules. That's about to go in the water in a matter of minutes. And um, all of our exploration is streamed live to shore. So if you also go to www.nautiluslive.org, uh, you can see what we're doing. And in fact, um, not this dive, but the next one, we will have Pablo's uh, laser system on the vehicle and you can follow along live with, with what we're doing. So with that, I'm just very uh, excited to to introduce Pablo, to have him out here on this expedition. He and his team have been fantastic. Um, and, and I think as he'll describe, you know, really have made some strides forward with their, their system and uh, just a pleasure to talk to you all. I'm on watch, so I'm going to have to head back uh, in the, you'll see the back of my head for the rest of this as we get the vehicle in the water and heading down. But thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Adam. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, as you as you heard, uh, one of the the key um, the key things that uh, that Adam's uh, project is doing is to really uh, explore areas that have been uh, 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 explore areas that have been traditionally uh, not seen. And here, because we're in the you know the equator, middle of the Pacific, uh, this is an area that is not very transited. So uh, there's not much data um, uh, of the, of the seafloor uh, minerals or, or ecosystems uh, alike. So uh, one of the efforts that NOAA is putting here is to really uh, do two things. One is to explore and collect samples and do traditional oceanography to really learn about, uh, about whether these areas are of such an important biodiversity uh, uh, impact that should be expanded into sanctuaries, but on the other hand, uh, uh, part, of the, part of the driver for uh, Adam's program is uh, technology development, and, and it is understood that uh, the way we're doing uh, ocean science is still is very time-consuming and very uh, cost-ineffective. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to to get a sample and to analyze it and, and do science that way back in the lab. Um, uh, and uh, part of the driver here, as I said, is to really uh, bring in new uh, technologies to, to do that. And to me, uh, I, uh, I really uh, was very excited to, to start working with this team. And, and that was one of the unintended consequences of the pandemic, uh, uh, which halted uh, our work in many aspects, uh, as you don't have to remind anybody of how hard it was to, to go into the lab and do our work uh, normally. So, uh, so we, we had more time to, to really explore all the opportunities for our technology. And one of them that emerged uh, was this partnership with, uh, with NOAA and the, and the OECI. And to me, as I was uh, really understanding a bit more about uh, what was going on in, in, uh, in, in ocean sciences uh, deeper, uh, I realized that, you know, essentially you look at the seafloor as a huge QR code, right? Uh, you know, what we're doing is essentially picking up little dots of those millions of dots that make the QR. And we're trying to explain a lot of things, uh, just looking at very limited subset of um, of dots. And that's because it's very costly and, and almost unaffordable really uh, to do to do this uh, this uh, this work uh, subsea. So uh, to me, the I guess the, something sparked in my head and I say, well, you know, what if we could bring the barco scanner, right? Uh, uh, this uh, camera to to really look at the QR uh, more extensively, faster uh, and more effectively than than we've been able to do before. So that was kind of uh, the genesis of this partnership with Adam's team and uh, and what really brought us here uh, to this expedition. Uh, so if I, yeah. So so you know we started looking at at, at the what, what is it that we want to measure? Uh, we want to see when we are uh, exploring the, the seafloor. And there are at least three buckets, right? Where mostly everything fits in. And first one is, uh, you know, bathymetry. And here is, you know, the science of really get the very detailed topography, uh, as we call it in planetary uh, DEM, right? The digital elevation maps. Uh, in this case, it's just uh, the ability to really uh, uh, discover new structures uh, to a level of detail, to a grid scale, that actually enables uh, scientific uh, research. So 
there is now technology, uh, sonar technology, uh, Doppler scanning that uh, chirping um, uh, acoustic uh, uh, in general techniques that uh, from a surface vessel um, enable us to have a pretty, pretty high resolution uh, uh, view of, of what's uh, what's happening under. So that's been uh, done for many decades and, and state of the art here is pretty, pretty spectacular. Commercial systems are already working on this. And uh, so that's you know kind of pretty well understood that bathymetry uh, we know more or less how it looks like and if you go to Google Earth, Google Earth sorry uh, you can actually see the oceans and you see uh, ridges and some areas that are a bit more uh, fuzzy and than others that's because uh, so far we've been able to do this mapping but not so much resolution uh, and what we're doing today in this expedition for example is to really come up with maps like the ones you see here on the left uh, to complement and so that Google Earth can compile all of that into, into a proper uh, map of the, of the CIFR. So uh, more interestingly, or, or I guess different interest uh, would be the what's happening under, right? So what is the 3D structure of the layers of sediment, um, rocks, and, and formations that happen below the subsurface? Uh, this is the, the sub-bottom uh, uh, domain. And for that, uh, of course, you know, oil and gas industry uh, has led uh, the work here, and uh, they've developed uh, pretty pretty uh, outstanding uh, techniques and ways to uh, to scan and to to again uh, deliver EM pulses uh, sub C to define layers find deposits uh, eventually just see things below the sediment layer so there is a lot of heritage there uh, a lot of uh, information that, that we have gained through that and there is technologies that are now uh, commercially available as well to do this type of analysis so we have the topography we have the uh, the structure of the sub uh, C, uh, sub floor, but uh, the the 2D composition, right? So the chemical composition of uh, of the sea floor, uh, that's that's been the that's what we're lagging behind. So this is where when I said before, this is where we're picking little dots of the QR code. This is where we're picking little samples at a time uh, to do the science in the lab because there is really no way uh, today, uh, at least a scalable way, to bring the lab to the sea floor. Uh, and we limited to to that uh, to that. So this is where where we really uh, started to to understand that uh, there is a potential uh, white space for us, blue space, I guess, since we're in the ocean, a potential area where uh, where we could um, bring to bear some of these technologies that uh, a lot of you uh, have worked with me on uh, in the Andes, in Antarctica, the Arctic, uh, lakes uh, everywhere. Uh, thinking about future exploration of uh, Mars and, and ocean worlds. Uh, here you're seeing uh, uh, how uh, we're going to start building from that and bringing those techniques now to the seafloor. And in a way, uh, it's been a very really satisfying journey uh, uh, that really, really started uh, for me about 20, 20, 22 years ago, perhaps, as I was studying grad school. And I was building what I think is still the very first uh, uh, underwater uh, Raman system that could uh, measure uh, chemical species in situ in a natural setting uh, uh, below uh, below the water level. And that was in Rio Tinto, uh, a place that most of you probably know uh, from the acidic Mars uh, analog uh, side of the story. And uh, I think part of the reason why, why uh, ESA uh, selected uh, a Raman uh, instrument to fly on the ExoMars mission one day we'll get there. Uh, uh, so uh, it's selected that because of the discoveries that we were able to make in situ in Rio Tinto uh, of these minerals like gerocytes, uh, uh, sulfate mineralogy that is indicative of, uh, of acidic waters, which of course coincided with the discovery of gerocyte on Mars by, uh, by Spirit. So all of that converts into becoming, you know, making Raman uh, spectroscopy the technique of choice to to go to Mars uh, with ExoMars uh, to uh, to explore these uh, ancient oceans. So in a way, that was kind of my first contact with an uh, alien ocean. Uh, unfortunately, it's long gone on Mars, but uh, but it's still uh, something that we can learn uh, about it today as we're exploring. And I don't have to tell you uh, what amazing discoveries we're making with perseverance and curiosity still. So anyway, so that you know took me on a on a on a journey. Uh, uh, to really start understanding more about, okay, what about other oceans out there? And then, as you know, Cassini uh, discovered the plumes of Enceladus. Uh, we understood that, wow, there is now liquid oceans um, elsewhere. Not all oceans, but today oceans. So uh, that took us, you know, took myself on a, on a different uh, career and, uh, and and started looking at, at more uh, advanced uh, subsea Raman systems that 
could be deployed uh, underwater. And instead of just looking at chemicals, uh, sulfates, iron, whatnot, and uh, instead of looking at, uh, at uh, uh, what is the organic uh, content of these waters? Can these waters be studied in situ uh, without having to sample uh, uh, with the laser uh, and apply Raman and, and fluorescence as well, uh, as you will see in a bit, uh, to really understand these systems. And uh, that uh, I don't think that necessarily led to the selection of Raman spectroscopy again now by NASA to to go onto onto uh, perseverance, but I think uh, that gave me a chance to really uh, now start playing on, on Mars with uh, with Raman, uh, both Sherlock and, and Supercam, and start learning about uh, how to operate these systems remotely uh, and how to do science uh, without other co without much context, uh, try to extract as much information as we could from, from Raman and, and, and try to answer the question, is Raman really uh, the, the right way to go about this, uh, given the benefits that it has? Quick, no sampling, uh, low cost, uh, uh, but of course, you know, the problem of sensitivity, Difficulty in, in understanding the, the the unique fingerprint uh, 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 nature of, of of matter. So there is pros and cons, of course, as you will see uh, in a little bit as well. So anyway, all of this to say that uh, eventually, all of this work uh, uh, led to uh, to to NASA funding uh, from PSTAR and um, uh, in about 2018 to really put together a team uh, that combined, uh, I think, for the first time. Uh, as far as I know, uh, efforts from four different uh, government agencies and a combination of uh, researchers from government, from uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, universities, and uh, almost most importantly, uh, minority serving institutions that are bringing this new uh, wave of ocean scientists to the, to the mix. So this is uh, the team that uh, originally started the research here uh, and funded with PSTAR. And, uh, then, uh, as I said before, through the pandemic, we develop closer ties with uh, with the Earth Ocean community, and this is where uh, uh, work with uh, with NOAA and OECI, as Adam explained, um, came to fruition. Uh, of course, uh, collaboration with the Ocean Exploration Trust, the owner and operator of this vessel that we are in here, and the ROV that uh, that you see behind me. Uh, and uh, University of Southern Mississippi, uh, which is effectively funding impossible sensing. Uh, uh, the company started uh, also uh, halfway between getting the money from NASA and now to really start driving commercial impact and applications of this technology subsea. So, you see, the, the team has expanded uh, quite a little bit. And, uh, and after four years or so, uh, we were able to complete the building of the instrument. And you can see it here in uh, mounted in, in flight configuration. On a, on a remotely operated vehicle. Uh, this is ROV Hercules, uh, which is able to take us down to uh, 1,500 meters uh, depth. And what you see here is uh, in the back uh, with all the logos there. So you see three three tubes. So the smallest tube is a, is a white um, strobe light. Uh, so this is just a flash uh, that allow us to measure and look at things with an RGB camera, which is sitting next to it, uh, the second smallest uh, cylinder. And the biggest tube, uh, the one with uh, with the logos, uh, that is the heart of the instrument. This is the the housing that puts in uh, all our optical and electronic systems that allows us to shoot a laser uh, through a window. Uh, that window that you see there, that is closed now with a tag, uh, removed for flight. Uh, this is where we uh, where we uh, uh, shoot the laser uh, through and scan the seafloor uh, at a distance from uh, anywhere from three meters uh, to 10 meters. Uh, we we build the system on purpose to be far-sighted, uh, meaning that we cannot see very well uh, close up, only because of course the, the future uh, generation of this instrument will be mounted on autonomous vehicles, which uh, do not like to, to fly uh, closer than three, four meters from the seafloor for obvious reasons. So if you're in an ROV like this one uh, and you get stuck in the sand, uh, you can pull from the tether uh, and bring it back. Uh, if you have a cable-less autonomous vehicle that gets stuck in the sand or somewhere, uh, that's game over and you're not gonna get it back. So so, uh, so we're operationally looking at, uh, at a safe distance for future uh, autonomous uh, operations of, of this uh, system. So in fact, this is the vision um, uh, that we have for this technology and uh, which is one that, uh, can measure on the fly, uh, can model on if you want, and uh, determine uh, what the baseline uh, environment looks like, uh, what is the diversity, uh, like you saw with Adam, uh, all these new coral species we're seeing. Uh, uh, in fact, we, we saw a, uh, 
a, uh, a three-legged uh, jellyfish the other days. The other day, uh, and it was only the second time ever that these species have been documented uh, across the world. So, uh, so just to give you an idea of, you know, you just drop an ROV somewhere in the middle of the Pacific, and, and you're going to be seeing new, new, uh, new species and new ecosystems right there. So, so the goal for us is to really uh, help scientists uh, map out the diversity of our seafloor. Of course, keeping an eye on the potential for uh, economic development of the seafloor uh, when it comes to, to these metals that batteries, uh, panels, turbines, even hydrogen uh, technologies are going to need uh, faster than than we want to admit uh, to really start decarbonizing and electrifying the economy. So we're looking at this dual application of this technology to uh, to measure um, both minerals and the ecosystems uh, where this happen, so that we can make smart decisions about where to uh, mine and where not to mine. Uh, uh, so of course, look at this from the space uh, uh, angle, and this is kind of the same thing we're going to have to do eventually on on the lakes of Titan and on the moons of uh, of, uh, of Jupiter Saturn. Uh, we not going to find corals and crabs, uh, most likely, but uh, we'll find that uh, it's going to be much simpler and cost effective to explore uh, the seafloor, uh, looking for these fence, perhaps, where life may have emerged. Uh, do that in a non-invasive, non-destructive way with standoff techniques uh, like the ones we're, we're using here. Uh, uh, so, uh, of course, you know, just to kind of reemphasize here, you know, things that we're looking at in the seafloor when it comes to, to energy transition metals uh, is nodules. And today, uh, unfortunately, the only way to, to analyze them is to really vacuum clean them uh, out of the seafloor, uh, which creates plumes and, and disturbs the ecosystems, not only in the bottom, but all across the water column as, this is, as these materials are being transported uh, topside. So we want to uh, be able to analyze those uh, in situ uh, non destructively. Uh, same with, uh, with uh, sulfide deposits. These are the materials that happen nearby the vents, uh, the thermal vents, um, acidic ones, black smokers. And a lot of them are covered by sediment, but these are very, very important uh, sources of, uh, of minerals, uh, whereas nodules uh, contain rare earth elements like manganese, cobalt, scandium, yttrium, uh, europium, all the lanthanides that you want. Uh, the sulfides contain uh, more of the traditional metals like uh, copper, nickel, uh, platinum, gold, silver, which are, of course, very important for energy transition. Uh, but you know, uh, instead of having to dredge uh, through and cut through the seafloor, uh, uh, now we can leverage all this uh, sub-bottom profiling that I said earlier with uh, chemical uh, uh, surface analysis to get the information we need to to make decisions. And lastly, uh, more cobalt and and iron happen in sea mounts, uh, similar to the ones we're exploring here. And here, the idea is again, as you can see, you've seen that a lot of corals happen in these sea mounts, not everywhere. So the idea would be to really uh, map out uh, the mineral to, to bio biodiversity ratios and start making, again, decisions about uh, what areas to protect as sanctuaries or monuments and what others uh, should be exploited for, for, uh, for uh, fighting against climate change. Uh, so in, in nutshell, uh, this is kind of the, our value proposition here for, for ocean scientists and, uh, and agencies, uh, uh, which is, you know, instead of taking years, uh, to map out uh, large areas of the seafloor, uh, we want to cut down that to weeks or days, uh, depending on uh, new operational concepts that we're developing of swarm uh, of AUVs, uh, essentially mowing the lawn. Much like you see farm vehicles in the farm today, uh, uh, one after the other uh, doing tasks, we think that that can be done as well uh, in our use case here. And the idea is, again, uh, stand off a non-invasive uh, uh, analysis, so we don't have to stop and we don't have to disrupt. Uh, and uh, having as fewer human operators as possible, so they can be doing more important things, uh, and the robots can just uh, drive themselves and deliver the insights that we need uh, in real time and fully autonomously. So uh, really streamline uh, ocean exploration for both scientific and economic uh, purposes. So uh, this is what took us uh, here, and it's another view of the of the instrument on the on the ROV. This picture is particularly special to me uh, because this was the first time this uh, machine went under the water. Uh, of course, it has been tested in the lab uh, in very ideal uh, conditions. Uh, this is the first time that it really uh, went down into into seawater. Uh, and you know, uh, we really, to be honest, uh, we see this uh, expedition as a technology demonstration. This was essentially, a, is it going to work? 
and how well is it going to work? Uh, period. That was my only checklist for this uh, for this expedition. And uh, luckily and happily, and this is why I'm here today, uh, uh, we have more stories to tell than just yes, we succeeded at making it work, uh, and we actually found very interesting stuff. which I'm going to show in a little bit. So very important, I think, uh, for me personally, uh, a career milestone at seeing uh, some of these technologies that I started working on in grad school 20 years ago, that eventually led to uh, to trying to understand ancient oceans on Mars uh, that NASA uh, wanted to see in ocean worlds. And now I am, and the world is seeing uh, deployed in our own oceans here on Earth, uh, where they are very much needed, as you as you heard from Adam earlier. So really, really exciting times. Uh, so uh, this is where, where it looks under the hood, uh, under the under the, the this leaf that you see there. Uh, that's titanium, uh, by the way. So inside, what we have is a combination of uh, Optics, electronics. Uh, if you've worked in space craft uh, assembly and instrumentation, uh, this looks familiar to you. Uh, we don't use beryllium here because mass is not such a big problem in uh, subsea. Uh, a problem for us is thermal. Uh, so, of course, you know, the ocean is an infinite thermal sink, and uh, our instruments, some of them inside, like to be cold, cameras, uh, some others like to be warm laser. So we are playing a balancing act uh, between the thermal management. That's what you see these copper pipes uh, on the back there. Um, and uh, all of the other boxes are electronic boards that control this very, very uh, fine-tuned orchestra of light and cameras uh, so that we can shoot these uh, pulses of light, these bullets of photons uh, that you see on the right. Uh, uh, and we can time the arrival time of these photons into the sample. And then on the way back into our camera, uh, precisely opening when we want it, no sooner and no later uh, than that. So. That's all the stuff that is uh, that is in here, and uh, and uh, the way we interface with the ocean outside is this uh, sapphire window that you see there in the bottom, um, uh, that is uh, essentially bolted into the into the into the titanium structure. So that's our eye outside into into the world, into the subsea world. Uh, and so, uh, apologize, I didn't have more time to make this prettier, but, uh, but I think this probably captures everything that I need to say about this. Uh, so. Uh, we're measuring three things with this instrument. Uh, so uh, this figure is not to scale in any of the dimensions, so uh, don't hold me accountable to that. Uh, but I think qualitatively, it, it explains how we measure things, right? So uh, we're measuring three things, a Raman, fluorescence, and luminescence. And the way we're doing this is by leveraging the fact that each one of these three phenomena happen at different times. So uh, when you shoot anything with a laser, the very first thing you're going to have is a uh, Rayleigh -like scattering. So essentially, whatever you shoot out is going to come back to you. In our case, green will come back green. Most of the light is that. So this instantaneous scattering coming back to you, that is not informative at all for us. So we try to block as much as we as we want uh, as we can out of that. But also very close to that trigger time uh, when photons interact and scatter from the from the rock or the or the water, we got the Raman effect. Uh, Raman effect happens in the femtosecond regime essentially instantaneously, but it's very, 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 very uh, faint. In fact, only one out of 10 to the 13 uh, photons, I'm going to repeat that, one photon out of 10 to the 13 uh, is Raman scattered. So uh, and it happens right at the same time, almost at the laser. So you can understand the almost the art and the wizardry that goes into uh, uh, slowing your detection system just just a tiny bit, just enough to get rid of most of the laser, while you capture these rogue uh, Raman photons that come back to you uh, to tell you about uh, molecular uh, information. So if you wait a little longer, uh, uh, you get something that's called fluorescence, right? So fluorescence, as opposed to Raman, uh, in Raman you have uh, uh, scattering, inelastic scattering, as opposed to to the to the one that uh, that the laser gives you normally. Uh, so inelastic scattering is Raman. Fluorescence is absorption of photons and re-emissions at different wavelengths. Uh, so fluorescence happens quite a bit after Raman, uh, perhaps a few nanoseconds before before Raman happens. And there is this this overlapping area you see uh, between the Raman and the fluorescence and uh, these blue and gray traces there. And this is what traditionally has uh, nagged and has bothered uh, Raman scientists uh, across uh, time and, and space, uh, because fluorescence is orders of magnitude more intense than Raman. Uh, it's essentially swamps Raman signals uh, if you're not careful. So one of the efforts that we've always put into doing Raman spectroscopy 
is let's get rid of fluorescence. So you start using uh, all kinds of mathematical, statistical, after processing uh, data uh, magic almost, to really try to reduce all of that so you can get your signals from Raman uh, pop out. And what we're doing here is we're, we're not only not doing that, we're embracing the fluorescence, but because we can do a time resolved uh, analysis, uh, we can actually time our windows and capture first the Raman, then the fluorescence, sometimes at the same time, if we solve this fire, so that we can actually start understanding what is the interactions of this fluorescence with Raman, where we can leverage all the information that comes from the fluorescence aspect, which is mostly the organic pigments and all the bio uh, stuff that happens there, and how that interacts with the mineral information that we get from Raman mostly. So you see spectra on that, where we combine these measurements in, in a pretty, pretty, pretty nice way. And lastly, if you are patient enough, uh, what you get is uh, luminescence, uh, which is another phenomena that, like fluorescence, involves uh, uh, absorption and re-emission of photons. In luminescence, uh, you've seen it before in, uh, in your science museum or your university, where you have a thick glass, uh, you have shiny rocks in the, in the back, and you flip a switch. Uh, black light shines on the rocks. Black light means ultraviolet light. Uh, you turn it off again, and then this, after a while, these rocks will glow in the dark in crazy colors from yellow, blue, pink, uh, and everything in between. And, uh, and that will uh, last for a while, right? So, uh, so luminescence is a way for us to uh, practically look at uh, these rare earth elements that I mentioned before, the manganese, uh, chromium, uh, europium, yttrium, uh, all the stuff that, that uh, we need for batteries and, and others uh, are typically very luminescent. So if you're patient enough and you have the ability to, to time uh, resolve this measurement, you can get luminescence as well. And we're leveraging that as well here. So all combined, we're, we're looking at uh, molecular bonding with Raman, looking at pigments and biomolecules, with fluorescence, and we're looking at mineral, minerals and, and rare earth elements with luminescence. So as you can see, it's a, it's a pretty pretty comprehensive uh, Swiss army knife of, uh, of, uh, of geo and biochemical uh, analysis tool. And that's what we have uh, down there in the super right now. So uh, some of our uh, conops or operational modes here is uh, uh, rastering. So uh, this is an example of a nodule that we studied in the lab. Um, uh, our cameras can do stereo to get the 3D uh, the profile of the of the rock. Uh, then we raster the, the laser. Uh, in the lab, we do it with mirrors. Uh, in the seafloor, with this version, we're in fact using the, the ROV uh, inability uh, to hold position to do a raster scan, uh, just leveraging the motion of the, of, the, of the vehicle. So that way we can do a pseudo image uh, or, a, or a map of what's happening in the rock. In this case, in the lab, we were able to to really find out the the minerals that are important for for a uh, for a for a manganese nodule, and that's just thanks to all the Raman uh, information and luminescence that you see in the top of the, in that little plot there uh, on top there. So, uh, some of the stuff that we did in the lab before we want to see uh, is uh, we look at, uh, at these crusts that happen in the seamount that I that I sketched earlier, um, uh, and. Again, leveraging a mix of Raman, uh, luminescence, and fluorescence, we're able to see phosphate, of course, uh, uh, hydroxides uh, as well, and uh, the organic uh, stuff, right? So in this case, that was a cyanobacterial pigment that happened to be in this crack that you see on, the, on that area. So anyway, this is an example of the types of uh, data products that eventually we're going to get uh, with this technology as we advance uh, our ability to do, to do this from the lab into the into the seafloor. So, uh, Another of my highlights, and I think for this week, really, really was for me and a lot of people here is that, you know, the first time we flipped the instrument on, uh, switch it on, and I was sitting right behind here, uh, as you can see, mission control, and we got the first data point. And uh, I think I said literally that uh, as, as, it, as, it, uh, as, it, um, as it happened. And somebody had to tell me to, to watch my mouth because all of this has been uh, broadcasted live. Uh, a lot of kids are listening. But couldn't help it, and I think you you will have you know you, you, if if you're working technology and the first time it works in a place where you know uh, it's very exciting for you, uh, I think this is the first thing that comes to mind. So anyway, uh, what we saw in in the top left here, what you see is the the picture of the computers uh, where we're uh, operating the instrument. On the left, you see our camera, the camera that I that I told you is uh, sitting next to the to the big laser bottle. And that's the laser beam you have. So you see the, the laser coming from the bottom. Uh, that's the laser beam shooting at the water. In this case, I think we were 
couple, couple hundred meters down, uh, maybe 100 meters. Of course, you know, all you see is water, but you also see these uh, white speckles, and that is marine snow. This is organic matter. And uh, in fact, what you see in the spectra, uh, uh, in the spectra that I, I'm kind of blowing up here, uh, is all of these things that we expected to see uh, better than I thought, in fact. So, uh, of course, on the left, uh, you still see some laser. Uh, remember that. Most of the light that's come back to you is laser, and you see, it, in fact, that most of the light is green. But you see the laser, and on the left, this laser line is really the laser uh, in the water. Uh, uh, it starts to turn blue, and the, what's happening there is that uh, as the laser is losing intensity near the window, uh, propagated into the water, uh, uh, we start seeing some of the fluorescence that happens uh, when some of this organic matter attract and absorb the photons and remit that into the blue region of the, of the spectrum. So, uh, so qualitative visual information and, and data points showing that, oh, wow, we can just, with the RGB image, see that there is a transition and there is a, 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 a fluorescence coming back to us from our laser, which was a good way to, to start the day. But then if you combine that with the spectral data on the right here, in which you're seeing uh, not just the, uh, the laser, but sulfate uh, ion, so this peak, they're uh, uh, sharp, uh, that is sulfate in water, sea water, no surprise there, but to me, it was very exciting to see that, you know, we can see these trace amounts of sulfate that still happens in, in the water. And then you start seeing more broader features and uh, the one shoulder to the water peak uh, in the mid of the spectrum, uh, that is organic carbon. This is fluorescence that is happening uh, uh, that we see in our, in our, in our uh, system. So uh, like I said before, we have the ability to gate out uh, fluorescence or bring it in. In our case, we like to bring it in because uh, uh, that way we can really observe with one snapshot the differences between mineral uh, emissions or other or inorganic emissions and organic emissions via fluorescence. So Raman inorganic and fluorescence organic is a very powerful combination we find. And then, of course, the rest of the spectrum is just water, uh, water bands. Uh, not surprising, right, since we're in water. But we like to have it there because it's a way for us to internally calibrate the instrument and, and have a reference uh, always of, uh, of what the abundance of all the uh, ions are versus the water, which is always going to be constant uh, amount. So it's a good way to do, start doing at least semi-quantitative analysis uh, using Raman uh, subset. So uh, that same day, if we, we reached the bottom, uh, and uh, to no surprise, the system was still working. Uh, and of course, you know, things change here. So I'm going to go back so that you see this is pure water uh, with uh, marine snow. And here, this is sediment. Uh, as you can see, this is almost like a beach. This was the top of a seamount uh, that has been eroded and sediment deposited there over millions of years. Uh, so uh, it's sand, essentially. So what we see is uh, a quartz, uh, no surprise either. Uh, still see some of the sulfate if you squint a little bit, but now you see that the this uh, this uh, organic uh, 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 fluorescence uh, feature has changed, right? So now what we're seeing is that uh, there is a different in shape and intensity of the of the organic carbon signal coming to us, which tells us that we're looking at the carbon that is deposited in the seafloor, and this is something that is called ooze, which is essentially a layer of carbon that accumulates uh, organic carbon coming from the tidal uh, uh, compounds, uh, fish scale and other animal uh, and algae uh, material, that slowly rains down and, and essentially it's a carbon sink. Uh, this is a way to capture carbon in the ocean. And, and there's tons of this in the, in the seafloor. So we, uh, we verify that throughout the expedition are gonna be seeing this all over the place. And this is a good news because this telling us that, uh, that you know, uh, this, uh, this organic carbon that has been sunk down there, this is, perhaps a thousand, if not longer, years old organic carbon. This is a great way to sequester carbon in the ocean um, if you're able to let it rain down slowly and keep the ocean temperature and acidity at a level that doesn't dissolve it. So uh, so for us, it was a really verification that we can actually start doing assessments of uh, of this ooze of this uh, carbon that has been sunk into the into the seabed. So pretty exciting times. So uh, you see on the ROV picture in the background, uh, you see this white, bright, uh, I don't know if you can see my my, my cursor, but uh, if you do, I'm pointing at this uh, circular white dot directly under the bumper of the ROV, and this is our laser. So we have visual confirmation of, uh, of how, how we're doing things. And by the way, if you're wondering, yes, there is a second ROV uh, here uh, that is called Atalanta, and Atalanta is a, is a relay uh, ROV that transfers data and power in and out of the ROV 
to the ship uh, here, to mission control behind me. Uh, and so, of course, has a camera, and we've been able to get very good documentary of our operations uh, that way as well. So, um, very exciting too. So, uh, one thing that we discovered uh, on, a, on, on, of course, I think this is the second dive now, where we knew everything worked, and we started to do um, uh, depth profiling, right? So, we're just shooting every 25 meters, getting one spectrum, as we're going down all the way from the surface to 1,500 meters. So, uh, what we saw is that as we're going deep, uh, the organic background uh, fluorescence starts to increase. And it's been documented before that uh, when you have salt, uh, certain organic species uh, are going to be uh, fluorescing more. It's essentially it's an enhancer of the fluorescence signal via salt uh, abundance. So uh, we're speculating still, uh, still uh, to, be, to be confirmed whether we can do a proxy measurement of salinity of the of the of the water uh, via organic enhancement in Raman, which if it's the case, it will be a game changer when it comes to uh, being able to to look at marine layers, uh, currents, and and other uh, uh, ecosystems as they happen at depth, uh, uh, which is related to the salinity of of these layers, of course. So, uh, so I think this really, really uh, something that we're going to develop a little bit bit uh, bit uh, further as we develop this uh, as we process the data when we're back home. Uh, so some of the stuff that we saw uh, down in the bottom in some of these uh, corals and in other uh, species, uh, we start seeing this is the fluorescence, pure fluorescence, right? So this is when, when we get out of the Raman, we wait a little longer and we only see fluorescence. So this is what it looks like for us. And what we see here is uh, chlorophyll pigment uh, in a lot of the cases. So, uh, so this is a transect, right? So what you see here is an overlay of perhaps 50 drop points that happen over a 100 or 200 meter traverse. So uh, some places you get, of course, more chlorophyll than others. No surprise. Uh, this is something that relates to what exactly we're shooting. Luckily, we do have uh, visual uh, tracking and geotagging of where we're shooting. So we can really, really pinpoint each one of the spectra to the to the physical uh, uh, properties of the, of the of the target. So exciting identification of pigments now uh, here chlorophyll B as it's preserved even after uh, the species is uh, long uh, dead and, and in the bottom. Or perhaps this is uh, active species that still have chlorophyll uh, uh, in there uh, today. So another area of research for us. Uh, uh, we, so, you know, this is an example of a traverse that we did. Uh, and here we have uh, a carbonate uh, sample. Uh, here we use the, the hand of the, of the ROV to break a little piece. So that we can uh, see inside, and uh, what we did is uh, is uh, take a measurement of this carbonate. And uh, unfortunately, we did not. I guess maybe you can squint, but I you know, like to do that and look at the Raman carbonate uh, signal here. Uh, and we didn't see that. Instead, what we see is the fluorescence profile uh, coming up at different uh, different inclinations, different elevations. In other words, the the shape of the fluorescence profile. It's changing depending on what we're shooting in that uh, white rock. To me, that's really interesting result because it's telling us that we have a combination of uh, both uh, uh, organic fluorescence uh, coming from uh, from the rock, and also inorganic fluorescence uh, coming also from the minerals. Uh, so uh, that interplay between uh, uh, how much mineral versus organic fluorescence is expressed here in these uh, differences in the slopes, uh, if you want, of these of these traces here. And to us, that was a good way to really start uh, taking a little bit of a, of, a, of a detour into the science of this after we check the technology is ready for scientific operations, uh, because uh, it is, you know, this confirmation that these particular uh, carbonate nodules uh, are really uh, catalyzed, are really nucleated by organic matter. So in fact, uh, we verify this with the scientists on board and, and say that, hey, would you say that there is a mix of organic uh, carbon and also carbon here? And they're like, oh, actually, in fact, that's one of the mechanisms that we were trying to test here is whether this nucleation of organic really, really creates an enhancement in, in the ability to mineralize carbon. So another way to really uh, start looking at these interactions of organic and inorgan inorganic carbon, which is very important as we're trying to do an accounting of the of the carbon stocks in the deep sea as we sequester carbon uh, down there. So. Uh, finally, uh, another, uh, so not surprise, but another uh, highlight, I would say, of, uh, of, the, of the expedition here in our test is that when we see uh, features like hydroids, which is 
a type of coral here that you see in the picture, uh, what we observe is a, is a shift in fluorescence versus the sediment. So remember, the sediment is loaded with this ooze, this detrital carbon that is coming from the, from the surface, which looks very different uh, uh, as evidenced by this shift in the fluorescence uh, of about 100 wave numbers, which is a lot. Uh, looks very different than this uh, fluorescence coming from the hydrate. So for us, it's a way to really flag in real time uh, how much uh, of you know sediment versus uh, 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 alive or or coral, if you want, sample you have there today. Uh, uh, again, in real time as we're flying through. Because uh, by the way, all of this show there that I'm showing here was collected in anywhere from five seconds to ten seconds. So essentially a real time uh, tool here. And uh, oh, there's one more here. And here, this is the last thing that we're still uh, trying to, to experiment with. Uh, and here, I highlight three peaks here. So on the left is sulfate. And on the right, uh, you have these two arrows. Those are uh, vibrational modes of water. And uh, what we're seeing is differences in the intensity of all these three peaks as we're going depth. This is the profile from, from zero to 1500 meters depth. And uh, if what I think we're seeing is true, uh, means that uh, we can compute, calculate these relative intensities of sulfate to the water peaks to start doing an accounting of uh, of what the salt level is again here. Uh, whether it's sodium chloride, of course it is, but there is, is there potassium chloride as well evidence here? We don't know yet, but uh, we're looking at this uh, distortion of the water bands, if you want, and that's what's expressed by these two arrows uh, by virtue of cations pulling from the bottings. Uh, this is the sodium, uh, calcium, and, and potassium, magnesium as well, perhaps. And we can think that maybe there is a depth profile as well of these salts, which again, if it's true, this really uh, can change the game when it comes to measuring uh, salt at depth. So no more niskin bottles, no more sampling, and you really have a, a very accurate uh, classification of salts in their profiles as you're going down. So we have one more dive, and we'll do a more intense uh, profile here. We'll get samples. Uh, different different depths to verify that in the lab, and hopefully this becomes a scientific result for us as well. Uh, so uh, to to sum up here, uh, uh, we've done four things already. So we measure we ability to measure as we move, uh, ability to measure not just minerals but also pigments. Uh, we can distinguish between organic and inorganic uh, carbon. Very important again for uh, for verifying carbon sequestration in the ocean. We can most likely uh, optimistically uh, measure salinity and different soil profiles in depth. And what's left to test, uh, and that will be the task for next year uh, at the next expedition, is test autonomy. So uh, all of this work that I'm doing here with uh, with the team, with uh, Kevin uh, Sack from uh, from Applied Physics Labs in Seattle, uh, we're essentially doing human intelligence. So we are operating all the knobs and levers of the instrument uh, on our own to understand how it works. And now we have enough information to codify that into into autonomous system and control that can operate this uh, this system autonomously. So it, the next version uh, of software upgrade will be able to to take telemetry from the ROV, understand depth, altitude from the bottom, uh, understand pitch, yaw, uh, and uh, attitude, and be able to adjust the focus, adjust the the, the camera options, the laser power, and all that on its own to get the best signal possible. And with that, in the next version of that, uh, we'll be uh, scaling this up, right? So uh, as we go into autonomous vehicles uh, that can operate for weeks, months at a time uh, without human intervention, uh, we can really start uh, drawing the cost of doing this down uh, from, I would say about $100,000 a day that cost to be operating here with ROV, hopefully to, to $10,000, a 10, 10 times uh, decrease in, in cost uh, via autonomy and robotics. Uh, so, uh, of course, I think the team will be able to do that. This is a stellar team uh, of, this is just probably half the team, but uh, this was a picture taken at the last team meeting before pandemic. And uh, I wanted to put it here because uh, this was taken at the at the college in the LA area called Citrus College. And Marianne Smith, who you can see there in the mid row, uh, blonde uh, uh, woman, she runs a program there at this minority serving institution through which we've been able to get a number of interns. By my account, we're about 20 to 24 uh, interns over the last four or five years, all of them from minorities and underrepresented uh, backgrounds uh, in STEM. All of those uh, folks have been rotating among labs on this team, the West Coast, East Coast, and, uh, and, and elsewhere. 
so we've been able to expose them uh, to this new way of doing uh, ocean sciences. So out of that, in fact, uh, a few of those chose to, to develop, uh, to go into master uh, studies to further their ocean uh, uh, careers, while they came from totally different areas before. So to me, that's one of the successes of the project is that, uh, that ability to inspire and to bring this new wave of uh, scientists to the to the to, to the field, uh, and I think that's really really something that I'm very proud of. Uh, and yeah, so this you know just to to kind of last light here, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking, uh, let you ask questions. Uh, so these are the three things that that really really uh, uh, are going to be the focus of uh, of our next uh, year work is to enhance our understanding of how we can uh, explore. Uh, our oceans better. Remember, how can we make this uh, bar barcode scanner uh, better and cheaper so it can be used throughout the seafloor uh, over time? Along the way, of course, uh, keep helping uh, the planetary community to find new ways to to eventually, when time comes, uh, explore our our alien oceans. And uh, perhaps even more importantly, uh, I think as we understand that. Uh, the only way probably to mitigate the worst of climate change uh, is going to be to develop a sustainable blue economy in the ocean. I think it's going to be more critical than ever to really educate society, uh, anywhere from, from policymakers to, to voters, uh, really, and to really uh, instill into everybody the importance of the ocean as, as our way forward uh, to the world that we all want to uh, live in and leave behind for future generations. So thanks everybody for uh, for listening. And I think, you know, I'll be happy to take questions uh, as long as you guys <laughs> want to stay on. Uh, but I understand if we have to cut uh, early. Happy to do that and happy to answer anything through email. You have my email there. And uh, yeah, anyway, questions. Hey, Pablo, I'll start with a question. Thanks for the presentation. I think this is great work and congratulations for the success. I can imagine that it hasn't been easy to uh, develop the technology to this point. Um, I wanted to ask you, I know that you guys have been also targeting hydrothermal vents. Uh, do you envision that being a target in the future that you will try this technology on, on those types of systems? Yeah, in, in fact, that was the, that was the, that was our ticket to win the PSTAR project is to, to study uh, black smokers as a potential uh, place for origin of life on Earth and as a potential place to look for life 2.0 elsewhere. The next mission on the books, uh, I'm happy to, to announce now that uh, it will happen next summer uh, and it will go exactly to these places uh, off the coast of Oregon in the Juan de Fuca region. And this is the axial uh, mound uh, which contains active venting and where the NSF has installed the cable, where uh, if you have an instrument technology and you're able to plug through the cable, you get free power, free bandwidth, and you can operate your instrument from anywhere in the world. So the mission is gonna go there next summer. Um, uh, we will not plug to the cable yet. Uh, next mission will be similar to this. We'll mount on the ROV. In this case, the ROV will mount it on the front. So we can look at the vent uh, and do a 3D, in fact, a 360, degree uh, overview of event, looking at the minerals, looking at the fluid, looking at the ecosystems that happen there uh, on these uh, setups and understand that a bit more so that in the year after, uh, which uh, we're now working on, on the funding for that, uh, then what we're gonna do is wanna bring this system as a lander and leave it there for a year to perform, uh, to my knowledge, I think the very first uh, high frequency, long duration, geochemical, biochemical investigation of event over time uh, to understand the dynamics of uh, life uh, evolution uh, in these places. Uh, and of course, geochemical evolution as we try to predict when this volcano is gonna explode next. next, And, uh, and also understand a bit more about how to operate this in the future. So yeah, I think once that we have now this, uh, we're happy with the instrument, it still works, it's amazing. Uh, after 20 hours, uh, I think total down there and thousands of spectra collected, now we know that we can go to these vents. So that's next summer. So yeah, I'll, you know, uh, you'll hear from me on that. Don't worry. <laughs> very cool, very cool. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. I'll throw another one if nobody has a question. Uh, what about shallower environments that uh, you don't have quite a deep 
uh, uh, or a thick water layer and, and maybe the bottom of the uh, sediment is more diverse and has a lot more stuff. Yeah, so uh, that's a fantastic question. In fact, uh, it's a no-brainer to try to do this in shallow because the cost is much cheaper. Uh, cost of building uh, subsea technology it, it essentially grows uh, up to the square. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a geometric progression of cost as you go down, right? So uh, ecosystems in coastal uh, seafloor, uh, seafloor meadows, uh, those are becoming prime uh, areas of investment by government to try to develop a ways to to sink and to uh, and to sequester carbon again. Uh, the story keeps coming again and again, but also as a way to build uh, uh, defense mechanisms, right? Defense systems uh, against uh, tidal forces and, and, and erosion. So yes, so in fact we're we're now working on a on a new project. Uh, still competition sensitive, so I cannot really tell names, but uh, essentially what we're trying to do is to uh, to adapt this technology to measure the water column and the and the seafloor uh, at 50 to 100 meters. And here is where we're trying to understand whether we can build artificial uh, uh, olivine uh, reefs that can become both an ecosystem, uh, a place to for life, coral reefs to, to build on top of that, but also using the properties of olivine that when we act with water, will mineralize carbon uh, dissolved in water into carbonates, thereby uh, keep them and lock them in there for, for millennia, hopefully. So yeah, I think the, the shallow operation of this technology is really another of the, of, the, of the future branches out of the system. But there'll be even a, there's a better reason even if, if, I, if, I, if I would go a little bit in the technology side too, is that uh, at shallow depths, we can unlock a, fourth mode of operation of this instrument, which is LIPS. The LIPS is the, let's say in this breakdown, look at ChemCam and SuperCam on Mars. Uh, we sap in rocks, essentially. And uh, and what happens is, of course, you know, you make plasma and the plasma has to expand against something. On Mars is great because there's almost no atmosphere. So beautiful sphere. In the lab here, yeah, it works well, uh, well enough to become an industrial application for decades already, LIPS. But in the seafloor uh, uh, or underwater, it's complicated because you have to expand against against uh, pressure, right? So uh, it tends to be very difficult to do that. Uh, but if you're in shallow water, uh, it is accessible. So we think that with the same architecture, we can enable this uh, LIPS uh, mode, which will tell us about the elements themselves. So really closing the circle on on the molecular information with elemental abundance. So yeah, definitely, uh, uh, you know. And I think since I have Dale here, uh, Dale, I think, uh, you, you wanna you wanna give us maybe a, a hint on 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 applications of shallow waters, uh, the ones that you're studying in Antarctica? Sure. Well, we um, Pablo Alfonso and I have been working also at uh, several sites in the Antarctic. One of them is a place called Lake Untersea, which is in the mountains of Queen Maud Land. It's a fairly large deep lake. It's about 170 meters deep um, on the north side, and and the second basin in the south goes down to about 100 meters. And interestingly, in the South Basin, below about 80 meters, it goes anoxic. And in the 1990s, um, Ulrich Wand and his group discovered that this area um, was really, really unusual and that it's got dissolved methane levels that hit 21 millimolar per liter um, in the water column and in the sediments uh, at the bottom. So this is another really great uh, place for us to work for ocean worlds exploration. And actually part of the lake is good for um, Mars lakes as well. So one of our thoughts is to try to get this instrumentation um, packaged in a way that we can lower it through the ice and into the water column towards the bottom um, at a future date, hopefully in the not too, too distant future. There's a, so, there's get, a so get busy. Uh, yeah. So get busy, uh, Pablo. <laughs> yeah, there, hey, there. you know, uh, after being in, in, a, in a boat for almost four weeks, uh, I will welcome uh, stability of the ice. Well, we hit, in well I, I, I recorded 122 mile an hour wind at the camp uh, a couple of weeks ago, so <laughs> don't get too excited. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. There's a question in the chat, Pablo says, how do we transfer lessons learned to uh, space exploration? Oh yeah, that's a good one. So, you know, uh, one thing that we, uh, learning here is uh, tele telepresence, right? Teleoperation. Um, 
in this case, you know, this is one of the examples where ocean is easier than space, probably the only one, is that you can operate without the latency of data. Uh, so, and in fact, infinite power. So, uh, so for now, so, so I think uh, what we're learning here um, is that what is the, what is the minimum required input by a human being? Uh, in other words, how much further to the autonomy side can we slide the scale? So that we don't have to have humans operating here, given that this latency problem is going to become true handicap in doing exploration, where you know we're not going to have a joystick on, we don't have it on Mars, so we're not going to have it on ocean worlds. So systems have to be have to be totally independent and autonomously uh, operating, and only beep and send a text back home, you know, when they find something exciting. Otherwise, you know, they have to be on their own. So what we're learning here with direct transfer is. Uh, what is the minimum level of required human operation that we can live with and and slowly trimming it down uh, all the way so that's the that's the biggest lesson learned here okay well uh thank you pablo this was really interesting and exciting um i don't know if there are any more questions in in the chat or anybody wants to ask i do have to jump to another meeting but um, we'll look forward to hearing more from you in Enfold and probably folks that now are also going to be interested to hear about the, uh, the how this technology moves forward. So uh, good luck with the rest of the uh, campaign and, uh, and thank you again for making the time to uh, talk to us. Hey, of course, no, thanks everybody for making time and short notice. Uh, really appreciate this and yeah. I mean, you have my email. I think this will be posted online, so feel free to distribute. And I think, you know, to me, one of the one of the takeaways is there are a lot of opportunities uh, for us uh, NASA folks to to work with ocean uh, people here, and this is one of them. So, you know, if you want the contact of Adam and, and Noah, I'm very happy to, to provide that for you because I think uh, I think it's really really uh, helpful to leverage that uh, to our research. So. Thanks again, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'll be seeing you in, I guess, conferences or, or if not here uh, once again. And, uh, and, and yeah, looking forward to what's next here. So cheers. Thank Thanks, you. Pablo.